P&O Cruises Pacific Adventure has recently been named in Sydney Harbour by Australian celebrity Ricky Lee Coulter, who has become the ship's godmother. May God bless Pacific Adventure and all who sail in her. Let's celebrate and come together. But hang on a minute. Hasn't Pacific Adventure been in service with P&O Cruises since 2022? And didn't she have a name back then? Well, yes, on both counts. Ship christenings isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. And throughout history, there's been many approaches to how shipping lines christen their ships. So let's take a look at the history of christening ships and understand the different ways that the ships are named. Hello, and for those of you who don't know me, my name's Chris Frame, and I'm a maritime history author and lecturer. If you're interested in cruising, cruise ships, or maritime history, I think you're going to like it here. So hopefully you'll subscribe at the end of the video. Ships have been christened for about as long as ships have existed. Long ago, the christenings could involve sacrificing animals, and in some cases, even human sacrifice, as a way to secure good luck for the ship and its crew. Today, things are a lot less barbaric, with champagne and some other forms of alcohol used. To keep things contained, for the topic of today's video, we will focus on the naming of passenger ships, including ocean liners and cruise ships. The christening process today generally includes the formal naming of the ship, and in Western ship christenings, the naming ceremony is often conducted by a female and often features the iconic phrase, may God bless her and all who sail in her, as a christening for the ship being launched. Coming back to our example of Pacific Adventure, the ship was formally named by her godmother in July of 2023, but the ship had already been in service under the Pacific Adventure name before this. In fact, when it was announced that the ship, which was originally sailing as Golden Princess, would be transferred to P&O Cruises, the name Pacific Adventure was also announced. However, in Pacific Adventure's case, the ship was transferred to P&O Australia during the COVID-19 cruise shutdown. And when she entered service in 2022, P&O had not yet had a chance to have the official naming ceremony conducted. This is something that we saw across multiple brands impacted by the pandemic in recent years. Prior to the creation of the Ocean Liner, there were many naming ceremonies hosted for smaller vessels, including sailing ships and the first paddle-driven steamships. So you may think that naming ceremonies and christenings have been conducted for all ships, but this is not the case. In fact, historically, several shipping lines didn't see much value in a formal christening for their vessels. Perhaps the most iconic example of this is Olympic and her sister ship Titanic. When White Star Line announced their intention to build these giant ocean liners, they announced the names of the ships well ahead of the launch of the vessels. You can see this in both promotional material for the ships that were being produced before they were launched, but also in the building site at Holland and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast. Here at the giant gantry, you can clearly make out the names of the ships being advertised to anybody who was witnessing their construction. Additionally, there was no christening ceremony for Olympic or Titanic. In fact, White Star Line had a policy of not christening their ships, and would simply launch them without too much fanfare. This is juxtaposed with other lines of the era, such as Cunard, who had a tradition of having a ceremony where they officially christened the ship. Historically, this was undertaken at the time of the ship's launch. But even with Cunard, the names of the ships weren't necessarily kept a secret before the launch. When it comes to ships like the iconic Lusitania and Mauritania, both ships' names were well known before the ships were officially christened. Fast forward to the 1930s, and Cunard's new Queen Mary had a slightly different start. She had been known by her build number of 534 throughout the construction period. Queen Mary's name was kept a secret until the day of the launch, and the reason behind this can actually be linked back to Cunard's merger with White Star, and the longer than usual time that it took to settle on a name for the new vessel. However, Cunard stumbled across a fantastic publicity tool by building the suspension and intrigue around the name of the ship. This is a very different approach to what happened with Queen Mary's original rival, the French Lines Normandy, whose name had been widely publicised before the day of the launch. Cunard's success with the media interest around the name of Queen Mary was so great that they repeated the process with Queen Elizabeth, keeping her name a secret until she was launched in 1938. They did this once again with Kiwi 2, whose name was kept secret until her launch in 1967. Behind the scenes, Cunard had arranged to name the new ship Queen Elizabeth following the usual naming practice of not including a suffix at the end of their ship's name. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II had been asked to christen the ship, but she didn't open the envelope containing the name Queen Elizabeth, and rather named the ship Queen Elizabeth II, presumably after herself. This triggered an emergency conversation between Cunard and Buckingham Palace, where Queen Elizabeth II, or QE2, was settled on as a styling for the new ship. 
If we look at the names of other great liners, we can see some other interesting peculiarities. P&O, for example, would often name classes of ships with similar naming conventions, after locations or areas of importance within the British Empire, and nearly always conducted a christening. From the turn of the 20th century, the Orient Line named all of their ships in a word starting with O, and would often have the ships christened by the spouse of one of the directors or leading figures within the organisation. Fast forward to today, and the naming practices of cruise lines remain complex, with most lines having a fancy and formal naming ceremony before the ship's maiden voyage. But many of the ships entering service today were built at Fincantieri shipyards in Italy. Italian shipbuilders have a tradition of formally christening or blessing the ship as it is launched or floated out. This means that many of the modern cruise ships today have more than one naming ceremony or christening, one at the shipyard and another when it is delivered to the cruise line. We can see this playing out with Queen Anne, the latest build for Cunard which is under construction at Fincantieri, where a madrina or godmother christened the ship with a bottle of Prosecco. The ship is then expected to have a formal christening when she enters service with Cunard. This would follow the same process undertaken in 2010 with the Queen Elizabeth and 2007 with Queen Victoria, both of which were built in Italy. Taking Queen Victoria for an example, and her madrina is Maureen Ryan, a social hostess who worked with Cunard Line for many decades. However, once the ship was handed over to Cunard, it was formally named in Southampton by Queen Camilla, at that time the Duchess of Cornwall. There are also differences in the christening traditions of the cruise lines. Many lines choose to christen their ships by following the tradition of having a bottle of champagne or sparkling wine smashed on the bow of the vessel. This practice dates back to the 19th century and is believed to have been first undertaken by Her Majesty Queen Victoria when christening a prestigious naval vessel. But there are some changes being made to shake things up a bit. Morella Voyage's christening featured a fireworks display, which has recently caused anger in the port of Malaga as it caused a 15-minute noise disturbance at midnight. When P&O's Ventura was christened, a group of military personnel scaled down the side of the ship and smashed the bottle of champagne on the bow rather than leaving it to chance, as an unbroken bottle is seen as bad luck. In the case of Pacific Adventure, the champagne bottle was opened on the aft decks of the ship and its godmother poured the contents into a champagne glass tower for the spectators to see rather than smashing the bottle on the bow of the ship. These days, most cruise lines make a big fuss about the naming of their vessels. It is a great public relations and media event. While historically christenings were undertaken by significant figures within the shipping line, or at the shipyard, or even royalty, today most passenger ships are christened by celebrities or other well-known people, which builds interest in media around the christening event. Generally, even today, females are usually asked to christen ships, and some of the most famous godmothers of cruise ships include Katy Perry for the Norwegian Prima, Jennifer Lopez for Virgin Voyages, Oprah Winfrey for New Staten Dam, and Mariah Carey for Disney Fantasy. NCL has bucked this trend with musical artist Pip Bull selected as godfather of the Norwegian Escape, while Raw Viking Line historically had both a godfather and a godmother for their fleet, including their former flagship, the Royal Viking Sun. So there you have it, ship christenings are a little bit more interesting than you might otherwise have thought. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you found the video interesting, and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And until next time, I hope to see you on board.